We, the jury, find the defendant, Centoya Denise Brown, count one, guilty first degree murder. First, we bring you the incredible and controversial tale of Centoya Brown, a name that has become synonymous with the fight for justice and the flaws within our criminal justice system. Before we delve into the gripping details of Centoya Brown's case, let's take a step back and explore the background and early life of this woman. Born on January 29, 1988 in Nashville, Tennessee, Centoya's life was far from ordinary. Centoya Brown's childhood was marred by instability and hardship. She grew up in a broken home with a mother who struggled with addiction and was unable to provide the love and support every child deserves. As a result, Centoya found herself bouncing between foster homes and experiencing a sense of abandonment that would shape her future. It was during this tumultuous time that Centoya's vulnerability made her an easy target for exploitation. At the tender age of 16, she found herself caught in the dark world of sex trafficking, a victim of circumstances beyond her control. It was within this harrowing landscape that Centoya's path crossed with that of Johnny Allen, a 43-year-old man who would become a central figure in the tragedy that unfolded. The details of their encounter are shocking and disturbing. Centoya, desperate to escape the clutches of her exploitative situation, found herself in a fateful encounter with Alan. What transpired that night would change the course of their lives forever. Centoya claimed that she killed Alan in self-defense during a sexual encounter, fearing for her own life. However, prosecutors argued that she had killed him with the intention of robbing him. The conflicting narrative set the stage for a high-profile trial that would captivate the nation. I thought he was reaching for a gun, so I'm like, oh, you know what I'm saying? That's what he's doing. He's gonna murk me or me or something. Yeah. And then what did you do? I shot him. The trial began with the prosecution painting Centoya as a cold-blooded killer, arguing that she had intentionally murdered Johnny Allen in order to rob him. They presented evidence and testimonies that aimed to discredit her claims of self-defense. On the other side, Centoya's defense team fought tirelessly to humanize her, shedding light on the traumatic experiences she had endured as a young girl. They argued that her actions were a desperate response to the horrors she had faced, a fight for survival. As the trial progressed, the nation watched with bated breath, divided in their opinions on Sintoya's guilt or innocence. The case raised important questions about the responsibility of society and family in failing to support vulnerable children like Sintoya. Finally, after weeks of intense courtroom battles, the jury reached a verdict. The tension in the courtroom was palpable as the judge read out the decision that would determine Sintoya's fate. The verdict was delivered. Sintoya Brown was found guilty of first-degree murder and robbery. The courtroom erupted in a mix of emotions, with some celebrating the verdict as justice was served, while others mourned the fate of a young girl who had endured so much. The judge, bound by the law, sentenced Sintoya to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. It was a devastating blow for a teenager who had already experienced a lifetime of pain and trauma. We, the jury, find the defendant, Sintoya Denise Brown, count one, guilty first degree murder. In the face of this crushing sentence, Centoya's reaction was a mix of shock, disbelief, and resilience. She refused to let her spirit be broken, vowing to fight for her freedom and for the rights of others who had experienced similar injustices. Centoya's case sparked a national outcry, with many questioning the fairness of sentencing a young girl to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It became a rallying cry for advocates who believed that the criminal justice system needed to address the unique circumstances surrounding juvenile offenders. In response to the public outcry, the state of Tennessee took action. A task force was formed to examine the issue of juvenile justice and propose reforms that would ensure fairer treatment for young offenders. After spending 15 years behind bars, Centoya's case caught the attention of Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam. He carefully reviewed the details of her case, considering the evidence, the public outcry, and the recommendations of the task force on juvenile justice reform. In a decision that shocked the nation, Governor Haslam granted clemency to Centoya Brown. It was a moment of both relief and disbelief for Centoya and her supporters, who had tirelessly fought for her freedom. On August 7, 2019, Centoya walked out of prison, a free woman. The news of her release was met with a mix of emotions, with some celebrating the triumph of justice and others questioning the decision. Centoya's release marked a turning point in her life, but it also reignited the debate about the fairness of the criminal justice system. Some argued that her case was an exception, while others saw it as a step towards a more compassionate and rehabilitative approach to justice. Shortly after her release, Centoya married recording artist Jay Long, a union that symbolized a new chapter in her life. 
However, due to Tennessee law, their wedding was conducted by proxy, a reminder of the restrictions she still faced. Despite the challenges she faced, Centoya remained determined to use her voice and platform to advocate for criminal justice reform. She became an outspoken activist, sharing her story and shedding light on the flaws within the system. In addition to her advocacy work, Centoya co-founded the JFAM Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating the public about the issues she faced and providing support to those affected by the criminal justice system. Next, we will delve into the life of Keandria Cook, a young woman whose actions left a community in disbelief. Cook's crime and subsequent sentencing captivated the nation, and the details of her case are nothing short of sensational. From using a dating app to set up a robbery to the dramatic courtroom proceedings, this story is filled with twists and turns that will leave you on the edge of your seat. The details of the crime committed by Keandria Cook are both shocking and disturbing, shedding light on the dark and dangerous path she chose to follow. It all began when Cook, then 19 years old, utilized a dating app as a means to set up a robbery. Little did she know the grave consequences that would unfold as a result of her ill-conceived plan. Using the Meet Me social app, Cook lured Perry Nita, a 28-year-old from Palm Coast, into a trap. She enticed him with promises of sex and marijuana, persuading him to meet her in South Daytona on March 22nd. Unbeknownst to Nita, Cook had orchestrated a sinister plot that would forever alter the lives of those involved. Nita, accompanied by Emmanuel Manny Purcell, now 18, agreed to ride along with Cook in his pickup truck. As the three individuals sat in the vehicle, a sudden and terrifying turn of events unfolded. Kendrick Bass, then just 15 days shy of his 17th birthday, emerged from the shadows and jumped into the back seat of the truck, brandishing a gun. Panic and chaos ensued as Purcell instinctively pushed Bass, attempting to defend himself and his friend. In the midst of the struggle, Bass fired two shots, one of which struck Purcell, causing severe injury. The sound of the gunshots echoed through the night, forever etched this harrowing event into the memories of those involved. The immediate aftermath of the crime was marked by confusion and fear. Purcell, wounded but resilient, fought for his life while Nita and Cook grappled with the shock and horror of what had just transpired. But the story doesn't end there. Shockingly, Cook and Bass teamed up once again just two days later, engaging in another carjacking. The details of this subsequent crime further underscore the dangerous path Cook had chosen. The investigation into these crimes was complex and time-consuming, with long law enforcement working tirelessly to bring the perpetrators to justice. However, due to a miscommunication and other factors, it took 10 months for Bass to be arrested. In the meantime, he inflicted further harm upon himself, accidentally shooting himself in the leg and foot with a stolen gun. The delay in his arrest only added to the frustration and anguish felt by the victims and their families. Keandria Cook's journey through the criminal justice system began with her initial sentencing, a moment that would forever change the course of her life. On that fateful day, Cook, accompanied by her her loved ones entered the courtroom at the S. James Foxman Justice Center in Daytona Beach, Florida. The tension in the room was palpable as all eyes were fixed on the young woman, awaiting the judge's decision. Circuit Judge Matt Foxman, known for his no-nonsense approach, presided over the case. He addressed Cook directly, acknowledging a couple of factors that worked in her favor. Ms. Cook here before the court for sentencing. A couple of things uh, going in your favor. One, you didn't hold the firearm during these episodes. The, the second is that um, the victim uh, luckily survived. That being said, this was uh, intentional. It was an orchestrated ambush and you are a main part of that. Firstly, he noted that Cook did not hold the firearm during the robbery that took place. Secondly, and perhaps most crucially, the victim of the crime had miraculously survived. However, the judge made it clear that despite these mitigating circumstances, the crime itself was intentional and orchestrated. She was charged with carjacking, attempted carjacking with a deadly weapon, and felony battery. The weight of the sentence hung heavy in the air as loved ones gasped in disbelief. Cook's mother, who had been assured by her daughter's defense attorney that she would not face prison time, let out a heart-wrenching cry. The courtroom erupted with emotion as Cook and her mother grappled with the reality of the situation. The reaction from Cook and her mother was intense, fueled by the shock of the sentence. They believed that the plea deal they had agreed upon meant no prison time. The unexpected severity of the sentence left them devastated and overwhelmed. The cries and anguish echoed through the courtroom, capturing the raw emotions of a family torn apart by the consequences of Cook's actions. After the emotional roller coaster of Keandria Cook's initial sentence,
sentencing, the case took another unexpected turn as a new plea deal was introduced. Cook, now living in Crescent City and represented by a new lawyer, Stephen Robinson, entered a no-contest plea once again. This plea deal would determine the fate of Cook and the charges she faced. Principal to carjacking with a deadly weapon, principal to attempted carjacking with a deadly weapon, and principal to aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. These charges carried severe penalties, including the possibility of life in prison. The gravity of the situation was not lost on Cook as she stood before the court, hoping for a more favorable outcome. Circuit Judge Matt Foxman advised Cook to cooperate with a pre-sentence investigation, emphasizing that it could only benefit her case. He urged her to stay out of trouble with the law and to maintain contact with her attorneys, who would provide further guidance. The judge's words hung in the air, a reminder of the importance of making amends and demonstrating a willingness to change. As the court prepared for the next phase of the legal proceedings, the question of sentencing loomed large. Guidelines suggested a minimum of 10 and a half years in prison, but the final decision rested in the hands of the judge. The courtroom buzzed with anticipation as everyone awaited the pronouncement of Cook's fate. However, the story took yet another unexpected twist. Prosecutors alleged that Cook had violated the conditions of her release by speaking to Kendrick Bass, the accused shooter in the carjacking. These alleged phone calls demonstrated a disregard for the minimal conditions of her pre-trial release. Assistant State Attorney Ashley Terwilliger filed a motion to revoke Cook's pre-trial release, seeking to have her jailed until the case was resolved. The revelation of Cook's alleged violation added another layer of complexity to an already tumultuous case. The prosecution's motion raised questions about Cook's willingness to abide by the terms of her release and the potential impact on her sentencing. The courtroom drama continued to unfold, leaving everyone on edge. As the legal proceedings moved forward, a new sentencing date for Cook had yet to be set. The uncertainty surrounding her fate only heightened the tension in the courtroom. The judge would ultimately have the final say, considering the evidence, the plea deal, and the impact of Cook's actions on the community. As the commotion subsided, months later, Judge Foxman allowed Cook to enter a new plea deal, citing miscommunication between Cook and her assistant public defender. Cook's sentence was ultimately reduced to 11 years in prison, a significant reduction from the initial 20-year term. Um, the jury having found you guilty of murder in the first degree, Miss Me, I will adjudicate you guilty and sentence you to life in prison without parole. Next, we will delve into the life and crimes of Jennifer Me, a teenager whose involvement in a heinous crime captivated the nation. Born in St. Petersburg, Florida, Jennifer Me's life took a dark turn when, at the age of 15, she became entangled in a robbery that resulted in a tragic murder. Jennifer Me was born on February 27, 1991, in St. Petersburg, Florida. Growing up, up, she faced numerous challenges and struggles that would ultimately shape her path. From a young age, Jennifer exhibited behavioral issues and found herself in trouble with the law. Her troubled upbringing was marked by a lack of stability and support. She came from a broken home and faced financial hardships, which only added to the difficulties she experienced. These circumstances left Jennifer vulnerable and susceptible to negative influences. Additionally, Jennifer Mee suffered from a unique condition known as chronic hiccups, which earned her the nickname Hiccup Girl in the media. This condition not only caused physical discomfort, but also drew attention to her in a way that further isolated her from her peers. However, she still made appearances on TV shows across the U.S., seeking a cure for hiccuping about 50 times a minute. Media outlets scrambled to have her on their morning shows, comparing her hiccup ordeal to a sneezing record. While the causes and treatments of her condition were debated, she remained a popular search topic online. Me tried remedies like sugar and peanut butter, breathing into a bag and getting scared to stop. The hiccups, before finding successful treatment with Dr. Bob Linde. Even after her hiccups ended, Me continued to attract media attention. In June 2007, she ran away from home, which was reported in the news. She later entered a relationship with Lamont Newton and devised a plan to set up and rob victims online. With the help of Newton and another friend, Laren Rayford, she carried out the robberies as part of her scheme. As Jennifer navigated her teenage years, she found herself searching for acceptance and belonging. Unfortunately, her quest for connection would lead her down a dark and dangerous path. When Jennifer Mee was just 15 years old, she became involved in a crime that would shock the nation. Alongside her friends, Laren Rayford and Lamont Newton, Jennifer hatched a plan to rob a man named Shannon Griffin. Under the pretense of selling him marijuana, Jennifer, Laren, and Lamont lured Griffin to a vacant home. However, their intentions quickly turned sinister. Once inside, they brandished a gun and demanded money and belongings from Griffin. Tragically, when Griffin resisted their demands, Laren Rayford opened fire, shooting him multiple times. The violence of the 
act resulted in Griffin's death, leaving a community in shock and disbelief. The trio fled the scene, leaving behind a lifeless body and a trail of evidence. The media quickly caught wind of the crime, and the story of the Hiccup Girl, involved in a deadly robbery and murder, spread like wildfire. Following the heinous crime committed by Jennifer Mee and her accomplices, law enforcement launched an intensive investigation to bring the perpetrators to justice. The police meticulously gathered evidence, interviewed witnesses, and pieced together the events that unfolded on that fateful day. As the investigation progressed, the authorities focused their attention on Jennifer Mee and her involvement in planning the robbery. They uncovered a web of connections and evidence that pointed to her active participation in the crime. Eventually, the evidence became overwhelming, leading to the arrest of Jennifer Mee, Laren Rayford, and Lamont Newton. The trio was charged with first-degree murder, a crime that carried severe penalties. The trial of Jennifer Mee and her accomplices became a highly publicized event, capturing the attention of the media and the nation. The courtroom was filled with reporters eager to uncover every detail of the shocking crime. During the trial, the prosecution presented a compelling case, arguing that Jennifer Mee played an active role in planning the robbery that ultimately led to Shannon Griffin's murder. They painted a picture of a calculated and cold-hearted individual capable of committing such a heinous act. Jennifer's defense team, however, sought to portray her as a vulnerable and easily influenced teenager, coerced into participating in the crime by her older accomplices. They argued that she should be held less accountable for her actions. As the trial unfolded, the media dissected every piece of evidence and testimony, sensationalizing the story and fueling public intrigue. The Hiccup Girl moniker added an additional layer of fascination, as people struggled to reconcile the image of a teenager plagued by chronic hiccups with the violent crime she was accused of. Ultimately, the jury deliberated and reached a verdict. Jennifer Mee was found guilty of first-degree murder, a conviction that carried a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. The media circus surrounding the trial slowly faded, but the impact of Jennifer Mee's actions continued to reverberate throughout the community and the nation. After being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, Jennifer Mee's life took a drastic turn as she began her journey behind bars. Adjusting to the harsh realities of prison life, she faced the daunting prospect of spending the rest of her days confined within the walls of a correctional facility. Next, we delve into the chilling tale of Samantha Grigg, a name that sent shockwaves through the small town of Saline, Michigan. This young woman's involvement in a murder case left the community in disbelief and forever changed the lives of those involved. Samantha Grigg, an 18-year-old from Saline, Michigan, made headlines when she pleaded guilty to manslaughter and unarmed robbery for the killing of 19-year-old Dustin Froka. The events that unfolded on that fateful night in February sent shockwaves through the community, forever altering the lives of those involved. Samantha Grigg, a seemingly ordinary teenager, had dreams of becoming a singer. She had even performed with her band, Undecided, at the Ann Arbor Summer Music Festival in 2012. But behind the facade of a young woman chasing her dreams, a darker side lurked. Dustin Froka, known by his nickname Defro, was an aspiring rapper with a promising future. He was found dead on a stretch of Interstate 69 in Bath Township, brutally beaten and robbed over a drug debt. The details of his death were gruesome, and the investigation investigation that followed would reveal a web of deceit and violence. It was during this investigation that Samantha Griggs' connection to Dustin Frolka came to light. She admitted to driving two accomplices, Tyrell Bredernitz and Brendan Heim, to confront Frolka. Grigg claimed that Bredernitz and Heim had offered her $100 in gas money to drive them to Frolka with the intention of roughing him up and robbing him. On that fateful night, Grigg drove Bredernitz and Heim to an apartment complex where they confronted Frolka. They forcibly took him and threw him into Griggs Ford Explorer, setting in motion a chain of events that would end in tragedy. As the night unfolded, Grigg drove the group to various ATMs, forcing Froka to withdraw cash. But as they traveled down the interstate, tensions escalated and violence erupted in the backseat of the car. Grigg would later recount the horrifying events to the court, describing how Bredernitz began to punch Froka, who, in a desperate attempt to escape, opened the car door and jumped out. The aftermath of Froka's death left a community in shock and mourning. Samantha Grigg's involvement in the crime would forever ever stain her name and haunt those who knew her. The trial and sentencing would bring some closure to the grieving family, but the scars left behind would never fully heal. Samantha Griggs' trial took place in the Clinton County Circuit Court, where she faced charges of manslaughter and unarmed robbery. The courtroom was filled with tension as the community awaited justice for Dustin Frolka and answers to the questions that haunted them. During the trial, Samantha Grigg took the stand, recounting the events of that fateful night. She admitted her involvement in driving Tyrell Bredernitz and Brendan Hines 
time to confront Frolka, but she maintained that she had no knowledge of the violence that would ensue. Griggs' defense argued that she was coerced into participating in the crime, and that she never intended for it to escalate to such a tragic outcome. However, as the trial progressed, shocking revelations emerged that painted a different picture of Samantha Griggs' involvement. Witnesses testified that Grigg had actively participated in the planning of the crime, knowing full well the intentions of Bretternitz and Heim. Text messages and social media posts were presented as evidence, revealing a darker side to Griggs' character. Prosecutors argued that Griggs' actions were not those of an innocent bystander, but rather an active participant in the violent robbery that led to Dustin Frolka's death. They painted a picture of a young woman who willingly drove the perpetrators to the scene, knowing the harm that awaited Frolka. As the trial reached its climax, the jury was faced with the difficult task of determining Samantha Griggs' guilt or innocence. After careful deliberation, they returned with a verdict. Samantha Grigg was found guilty of manslaughter and unarmed robbery, crimes that carried a maximum sentence of 15 years behind bars. The courtroom was filled with mixed emotions as the judge prepared to deliver the sentencing. Dustin Froka's family, still grieving the loss of their loved one, hoped for justice to be served. Samantha Grigg, now facing the consequences of her actions, awaited her fate with a heavy heart. In a powerful and emotional moment, Dustin Froka's family addressed the court, expressing their pain and the impact that his loss had on their lives. They spoke of the void left behind and the dreams that would never be realized. Their words resonated with the courtroom, leaving not a dry eye in the room. Finally, the judge pronounced Samantha Griggs' sentence. Taking into account her cooperation and testimony against her accomplices, the judge showed leniency. Grigg was sentenced to 5 to 16 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after serving a portion of her sentence. The courtroom erupted in a mix of emotions. Some felt that justice had been served, while others believed the sentence was too lenient given the severity of the crime. The community was left grappling with the aftermath, trying to make sense of the senseless tragedy that had unfolded. As Samantha Grigg was led away to begin her sentence, she turned to face the courtroom, tears streaming down her face. In a moment of remorse, she whispered, I would like to extend my deepest remorse to the family of the victim. He was a fellow musician. It really breaks my heart. And I, I wish I could take it back every day. Thanks for watching. Click on the videos on your screen for similar content.